Welcome to the Self Belief Podcast, where we talk with people who have great influence in the Metro Detroit business community, and we discuss all aspects of their journey, including the moments when they have had to draw deeply on their self belief to achieve their vision. I'm your host, Keith Baldwin, and with my co-host, Jordan Chaffetz, and we are sponsored by Regal Payments and JAC Digital, as well as our studio partner, Office Evolution of Troy. These conversations will potentially make you re-examine your beliefs about business, people, and life in general. Here's a taste of what's coming up today. My prices were always so incredibly low in the beginning. I was afraid to raise my prices. I just started. Um, all of those worries, and they're all wrong. But he said, if you raise your prices and, um, and everyone complains, it's too high. If no one complains, they're too low. And just a few people complain, it's perfect. Let's explore and scrutinize together as we unlock the mind of today's guests to provide you with inspiration and tangible takeaways that you can choose to apply in your life. Today's guest is Frank Lanzon Tamarazzo. Welcome, Frank. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure. Appreciate it. And Frank owns uh, Chazano or Chazano for the correct... The person. second time was better. Yes, I've been working on it. <laughs> I understand. It's like... Ch- <laughs> yes. See, uh, in Bach. That's right. And it's Chazano Coffee Roasters, and they're located in Berkeley, Michigan. And uh, they recently moved there from their Ferndale location. And uh, one reason we're excited to speak to Frank is not only is he very passionate about his business and coffee... Um, it wasn't what you grew up imagining you would do. It was kind of a side passion that became a full passion. Absolutely. So I never thought I would um, have the insanity um, in- infect me of opening up my own coffee roasting business. That's just insane, crazy. Um, I first started, I wanted to be an opera singer, so I went to Manhattan School of Music. Then I wanted to study the great books, and I went to um, St. John's College. And then realized that my passion for scholarship and learning and studying and singing, um, there was a great way of of fulfilling that that through being a cantor in a synagogue. Amazing. Um, And so went to um, Jewish Theological Seminary in Manhattan and uh, did that for five years, got my degree and all of that, um, and uh, had a career for about 20 years and about, about... a couple of years into the beginning of that career, my mother-in-law gave me $100 for my birthday, and I bought a coffee roaster, a small little home coffee roaster. Why, why was the $100 used for a coffee roaster? Because Starbucks first came out around then, and the coffee was extraordinary. It was only, uh, there were only a few shops all over the country. Uh, I think there were only three at the time, and it was as fresh as could be. Um, and I used to get a pound of coffee shipped from Seattle every... So how did you hear about them? There were just three in Seattle and you're in New York. Uh, Because there was... um, uh, I was a cantor in Chicago and and in New Jersey and um, and there was... There were three. There was, I think, one in New York, one in Seattle and one in Chicago. Okay. And uh, it was... And it was some of the best coffee ever uh, until I came along. But um, it was... It was great. And I said, you know, I have every little gadget known to um, humankind. Uh, let me buy this coffee roaster, a couple of ounces of coffee. It was Costa Rica Tarazu. And um, it was the best cup of coffee I ever had. It was chocolate. It was caramel notes. It was like a fine glass of wine. Started getting a couple of more pounds, tens of pounds, hundreds of pounds, thousands of pounds in my garage. Wow. I went from being a, a canter in New Jersey to Chicago to Farmington Hills. And I brought all my stuff and all my beans and would roast the coffee late at night from 1030 to 1 o'clock for about 10 years. That's absolutely amazing. So what's like the process of making coffee? Well, it's it's a simple process. It's not rocket science at all, but it's uh, there's a measure of geekiness. There's a measure of of a passion for it and loving food and loving all the different notes. Um, wine has 750 different flavor profiles and coffee is 1,500. So there's all this complexity to coffee. So putting it in the roaster, whatever kind of roaster you have, I have a drum roaster and um, um, cooking it, 
roasting it has to do with um, the ambient temperature, the temperature outside, the vine which I'm roasting, how quickly I get to a certain temperature, how slowly, the altitude wow. at which the coffee grew, the soil quality, which side of the mountain. Um, where is it going to? Is it going to a, uh, a deli or is it going to a, um, an Italian market? I'm wow. going to roast it differently depending on the clientele. Or um, if it's a bakery, what kind of baked goods do they have? What coffee will rip out the different notes of that? I didn't realize there was so much going into making coffee. I mean, I just have it because I love it and I need caffeine, but wow. Makes me appreciate it a lot more. It's a crazy amount of uh, complexity, but it's really, it has to be a passion. Like when you're cooking something, even at home, uh, cooking your favorite dish, um, where you, a dish that you're known for in your family, um, this, this amount of passion about intuition that goes into um, creating that, that meal. Yeah, just touching on the geekiness that you talked about, I want to talk about your coffee uh, before we go back into your, how you transitioned into opening a coffee store. Uh, Jordana, you may not uh, get uh, Frank's newsletter because she said you didn't realize there was so much into going into coffee. But he describes a couple of his uh, new coffees that he's got in. And so they start off pretty simple. You had your Ethiopia shaker with notes of pine, lemon, English black tea. I can kind of see that. And then the next one, you've, you've gone a bit more. You've gone tomato, basil, cucumber, balsamic, green wow. pepper, salt, tobacco. Reminds me like <laughs> of an Eastern European cafe, that one. I don't yes. want to necessarily drink that. <laughs> but then your Ethiopian wash wash is orange cream cigar. Whoosh, whoosh. Eh, whoosh, whoosh, wash wash. <laughs> tomato, tomato, right? <laughs> orange. It's, it's more fun to say whoosh, whoosh. Whoosh, 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 whoosh. Okay. Your Ethiopian whoosh, whoosh is orange creamsicle, orange rind, mandarin oranges, chocolate covered Granny Smith, and grapefruit. Yes. So I like the one that you didn't just say, ah, oh, it's chocolate. And it's Granny Smith. You're like, yes. it's chocolate-covered Granny Smith for sure. It's actually a customer who, um, who tasted it and said, hmm, chocolate-covered Granny Smith apple. So, um, and then I tasted it. Oh. It's, it's very suggestive. So when you do any kind of tasting anywhere, um, someday uh, if you ever go for a wine tasting or bourbon tasting and the person who's um, – um, serving it to you says this tastes like X, Y, and Z, in your head, you're going to automatically taste that. It happens a lot of times. Sometimes you say, no, it doesn't taste like that at all. But all those coffees have all those crazy notes. It's relative. It's really, uh, will you taste all those notes? Maybe not, but maybe you'll taste a whole different set of notes. And it has to do with your particular taste buds uh, and not about good or bad. So cool. Uh, it really has to do with um, what kind of foods do you really like? What kind of foods do you hate? Um, are you a smoker? Smokers often don't like the tobacco notes in coffee, hmm. um, I found. Anecdote, but um, there's no studies on that, <laughs> um, just for my uh, experience. But um, all these coffees have all these different notes, and it's part of the geekiness and part of the, the joy and the passion of every time I roast a, a uh, 10 pounds of coffee, it could be something slightly different. I used to tell, I, I used to have uh, several roasters working for me, people uh, roasting coffee for me, and I was off doing different things, um, uh, different front things in my life. And, um, and they wanted to know, one roaster asked me several years ago, um, do you want it to be consistent? Oh. And so... And it was an awesome question because the coffee changes. So if I roast Ethiopia Harar, which I joke around, it's what God drinks, has notes of blueberry, cherry, pipe tobacco with a red wine finish. But if I roast it very, very light, just right before what they call first crack, that cracks like popcorn, a bit coffee, and it tastes like blueberries, just blueberries, nothing wow. else. And so... Which way? Should it always be the light roast or the medium roast? And I said, I just want it to be consistently awesome. That's it. doesn't have to taste the same thing. It's th We're not a humongous coffee company where I have coffee in Ohio and Idaho and all, all around the country or the world. doesn't have to taste the same. Just ask that every time someone picks up a cup of my coffee, I want them to smile. This is an awesome cup of coffee. I love that. Yeah, I know the... the 
the quality of your coffee is something that's very important to you. And we talk about these different um, flavors and, and in there. With wine, how scientifically, how different is coffee to wine? How many different flavor profiles are there? I mean, it's, it's really double, about 1,500 okay. um, different um, flavor profiles for coffee and 750 for wine. Okay. Sake has um, wow. way more oh, than really? coffee and wine. Um, and it goes on and on. But uh, you know, bourbon, chocolate, all of those uh, different uh, specialty foods uh, have a crazy amount of different flavor profiles you can expect. Yeah, one thing I love about kind of your story and what you do is how passionate you are about it. Have you always dove passionately into things? You mentioned you, you grew up in New York and you became an opera singer. Did you find opera one day and that was your passion? Yes. So um, um, is it, it's the reason why I've never golfed. Did you ever perform in, in an opera? Uh, I, I have. I yeah. have, and, um, and I, that was, like, my main goal. And um, I've done tons of recitals wow. um, with my wife, with other, um, other singers. Um, we're hoping in about two years to uh, have the time to, uh, to practice and uh, do another concert and do some fundraising concerts Amazing. for different uh, local groups. Because, right, an opera about running a coffee shop, maybe. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. If anyone wants to um, compose that, that'd be great. Yeah. I mean, you can feel your passion for coffee just the way you're sitting here chatting with us, which is amazing. What was, like, one of your favorite operas you were in? Well, or you performed in? A bit, one of my favorite operas that I've um, done scenes from is uh, La Boheme. Okay. La Boheme is, um, is one of my f – it's – if there's only one opera, it would be La Boheme. It's just uh, awesome arias. Um, um, almost every aria is one that uh, you walk out singing wow. and, um, and you can't get out of your head. And I always joke that even if the janitor uh, sang La Boheme would still be awesome. You know, anyone who didn't have any kind of skills at all, uh, but because the music just is absolutely crazy gorgeous. Yeah. Now, I know when you were doing opera in New York, we had spoke briefly before. You, you grew up, your mother was Jewish and your father was an Italian Catholic. And yes. Religion wasn't a huge part of your life when you were quite young, right? Not at all. And Not then, at all. I always knew I was Jewish, but it was right. never, um, um, it wasn't, I, it was just my identity. Uh, we weren't observant in any way. And uh, then I meet my wife, Lisa Lanscron, uh, and um, her family is passionate. The way I'm passionate about coffee and everything else I do, um, she, her family is passionate about Judaism and uh, went to a Passover Seder. Uh, um, big meal takes about like four or five hours of singing, talking, scholarship, and loved it. Absolutely loved it, but I felt like a moron. I felt like an idiot because I had studied up to that point French, German, Italian, uh, Russian, uh, several other languages, ancient Greek, and uh, medieval French. Um, but I knew not one letter of Hebrew. And that drove me crazy. Why you studied medieval French? Because <laughs> I went to St. John's College. It's a very good question. You know, I'm surprised I mean, you didn't French, ask why, why not ancient Greek, but. Uh, We'll, well, we'll ancient Greek, you you know, Latin, you understand the kind of more the uh, those those type of uh, languages. But I've never heard of anyone go for medieval French. Yeah, yes, it's quite yes. Conditioned. Because uh, we wanted to translate Pascal, okay, and um, and all those philosophers mm -hmm. during that time, um, Descartes, and um, and read it from the original. Same thing with the ancient Greek. Wanted wow. to. Uh, uh, translate Sophocles. So this is a great book school in Annapolis, Maryland. That's uh, non-denominational. It's not a uh, Christian school. It's St. John's College, and it's right across the street from the Annapolis Naval Academy. Um, and all you do is you sit around in a seminar kind of fashion, and you, uh, after you've read these great books like uh, the Peloponnesian Wars or S Sophocles' plays or translating the... Uh, um, the old, the, the New Testament um, from the ancient Greek, uh, you talk about it for about wow. two hours. And there is a professor in the middle of the room who uh, asks everyone questions and just have a conversation. So what, and that was your college? Uh, that was one of my colleges. I went to 11 years of college before I got a degree. Oh, wow. Oh, my goodness. Um, 
I, I would have. What was that? What was that course called? What was that degree in? Where, that where was a degree about? in um, in advanced mathematics and uh, philosophy. Oh, philosophy. Okay. Um, so that makes sense. We we learned from the uh, 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 from the Principia. Uh, about calculus, we learned everything, every math, science from the original books. Wow! Hmm. Went through all of Euclid's. Um, uh, now was this while you were still doing opera, or it was? I was still doing opera, and they actually had. It was a small school. I always went to small schools. Uh, Manhattan School of Music had like seven hundred people in it all together. Um, at college for opera singing and um, and other music, and um, and then St. John's College had four hundred, a right. wow. hundred in every um, class. And I came from New York City, <laughs> where that uh, there four hundred people in the same room, kind of on the same subway, right. you know, kind of thing. So um, uh, that was cool. Um, and then uh, at at the seminary was was small too. So what made you decide to? transition from opera singing to moving into being a cantor at different synagogues? It, it was the whole... Well, when I went to Annapolis, Maryland, St. John's College, it's so interesting. I, I tell my friends, my business friends, my kids that be open to every possibility. You have no idea what you're going to do when you're 20, when you're 25, even when you're 54, you don't know what the future holds. So I go, uh, I go to the, um, my wife's family and I'm just floored by the uh, beautiful singing, by the scholarship, the conversations they're having. I don't know Hebrew. I go back to St. John's College uh, in Annapolis, Maryland, and she's uh, in New York. Uh, we're dating at this time, and um, and there's a Jewish professor there who uh, who knows Hebrew fluently. I start studying with him, and uh, learns uh, to read Hebrew in about three months. And then I started going to synagogue. Started going once a week to synagogue, and then I started to go. A couple of days every week, um, and so it built up that passion. And I realized that that was really one of the things that I really should be doing with my life because it had to feed that scholarship. I love coffee roasting; it doesn't seem like it, but when you're a chef, a coffee roast, you're learning every day. There's something new. There's something new in the ingredients in the beans. Uh, there could be a completely different note. You learn things. As a business owner, you learn things all the time. Um, and so between the scholarship of St. John's College and the passion that I got for Judaism and, uh, and singing Jewish music, I said, it, it really happened. So I was thinking about this seriously, and my, um, my mother-in-law said to me as my wife was uh, – uh, trying on different dresses for a concert that she was going to do. Um, we were talking about, she said, Frank, if there's something that's really easy for you and something you're passionate about, that's what you should be doing. So it's good advice. I, and whatever promise I ever had as a cantor, I always blamed her uh, for that, <laughs> for that conversation, because that was um, uh, really what led me to, uh, to investigate that and then get a master's in sacred music and diploma of cantor. Yeah. You don't do things by half, Frank. <laughs> no, no. I you mean, like um, quite a journey. My goodness. It's a, your story is amazing so far. I'm excited to hear how you got more into um, coffee. Yeah, I mean, because you've, like you say, you've now done a master's in, in, in theological music and yes. now you're a cantor and that's your passion, right? Yes. So how does a side hobby, side hobby, overtake your passion and become your new passion? Well, part of it is that my wife and I also love food, love uh, go to the best restaurants. Uh, just as a matter, it's maybe a, a, a new restaurant comes, comes to town. And we love discovering places where even after having the appetizer that uh, if you died after that, you'd be okay. <laughs> uh, that it was so good that that's the last thing on your lips. Um, but the other thing is that most places that you go where the food is extraordinary, the service is great, and then you ask for – and the dessert. Oh, the dessert is fantastic. Right. And then you ask for a cup of coffee, um, and it's awful. 
it's awful, and that really uh, destroys my soul uh, because the last thing on my lips is going to be that really not good cup of coffee. And, uh, and so that was part of the passion because I'm roasting coffee in my garage in New Jersey, Chicago, Farmington Hills, and I haven't had – and I still haven't had better coffee than mine. I've gone places where the coffee was really good, but it wasn't better. Do you, do you think those restaurant owners sometimes don't invest in their coffee because they want you out the restaurant to turn the table? Oh, or that's a huge part. Or they're just part. trying to cut the cost? There was a major restaurant um, um, in Detroit that the general manager and all of the staff would come to Hazano um, every week and just – buy a lot of coffee. They'd buy coffee for their home. They'd buy coffee everywhere. And I said to him one day, I said, why? Why don't you have me in your restaurant? He said, because we have a three-month wait for tables. Wow. And, um, and if we had your coffee, Frank, they would sit and they would smile and they'd talk for another half hour and I need to turn tables. So that's a big part of it. And also uh, the amount of uh, it's not something, the first thing they think about. And when you own a business, you have to think about return on the investment. Um, and having a bad cup of coffee at the end is not going to destroy everything. It's going to destroy my life. Right. But, um, <laughs> but it's not going to uh, destroy your business and it'll get people leaving sooner. Uh, but on the other hand, if you have an awesome cup of coffee with a brunch, um, people will go there because there's an awesome cup of coffee. And um, that's easily demonstrable. That makes more sense. I mean, for me, I would 100% have a coffee at a brunch, but I'm not sure, like, if I would go somewhere and then want to have a coffee at the end of the meal. Like, I've not, when I've been friends, like, I'm a millennial, and, like, I've just never seen that before, but it's very interesting, like, to have your coffee at the end of the meal. Have you, have you been to Europe? I have, yeah. but... We that's do that I, all the time. That's though. when I wasn't really drinking coffee very much. No. Yeah. It is a more European thing than an American thing, to have coffee at the end of the meal and sit and chat. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. yeah, I'm uh, even um, crazier, and uh, I would never do well in Europe because um, I like to have the double espresso, you know, sometimes before yeah. before the meal and maybe even during the meal. Yeah, um, yeah I guess, you know, a question for you is as well, talking about that leap and making that, that jump to uh, running your own coffee business, it's fine in conception of I want to do this, this is my new passion, but now you've got to leave a, a job that's paying you and go to a job that you've got to invest money into. How do you know when that's the right time and uh, to make that leap? Uh, because part of it was that my philosophy is life is short. Life can be short. Yes. So you never know. Maybe I could have waited another 10 years, but um, it just seemed like the time was right. I had also been preparing for this. I had a little... Uh, private joke that if I ever had a nervous breakdown and decided to go into coffee roasting business, um, I had a business plan. So over about 10 Sorry. years, I would have a little side hobby, not only just roasting coffee, but I would have a side hobby about um, writing business plans. And I wrote about like 10 or 15 different business plans over that time and redid them um, just for fun. Like, if I ever had my, a choice to uh, open up a coffee roasting business, what would it look like? What would the customer service be like? Uh, what would I serve? All of that. So I already had that already planned out even before I started. So day one at the cafe, I had it all planned out. That's amazing. Um, and so that – and also just the, the, if it's my passion, then I went to um, bookstores and I read everything – about every business book known to uh, the world, I pretty much have read. Um, probably new ones that have just come out um, that I have not read. Right. But uh, anything uh, 10 years ago and, and earlier, everything that I could find, I've read. Because most, a lot of the books are awful. Um, you know, books about anything, most of the books are awful, but you find one good thing in it, it's worth right. it. Yes. Um, I've always felt that way. If it's a terrible book and I have forced myself to finish it, but there's something you can get out of it. And so I prepared myself for that um, and made sure that I did it right. Only the biggest thing that you can't prepare for is the financial because you just don't know what you need. Right. I had way too much staff in the beginning because I wanted the customer service to be stellar. 
and uh, I was paying a lot of money in payroll. And the beautiful thing is that people like working, thankfully, at Hazano Coffee, and so they stayed a long time. And so every year I'd raise their salaries and uh, my payroll got bloated. And that's the only thing that caused me major trouble throughout all my my business. So for some of those issues, uh, I mean, once you're up and running, uh, maybe you can't always get out the book. Did you turn to any mentors in the local business community for advice? I did. I did, and I didn't take it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> because uh, I'm this, uh, I'm obnoxious in a, in a, in my own kind of way. Okay. That um, I need, like, if God came down to me and said, "This is the way, Frank," I'd say. Give me a couple of minutes. Let me let me think about that okay. kind of thing. Um, I need um, um, I need self confirmation about that. So yes, there was uh, Ken Sewell, uh, business coach locally, and um, and he was very helpful. Taught me um, two awesome things. One of those things was that if you – my prices were always so incredibly low in the beginning. I was afraid to raise my prices. I just started. Um, all of those worries, and they're all wrong. But he said if you raise your prices and, um, and everyone complains, it's too high. If no one complains, they're too low. And just a few people complain, it's perfect. Um, that was uh, something that's always – that's a huge uh, burden off my shoulders because it was a very easy way of deciding what my prices were, would be. It's very smart. And how much money I needed to pay payroll, buy more beans, all of that fun stuff. Yeah. Yeah, and we've, as we mentioned, most episodes we talk about culture and what people are building, and people aren't necessarily just coming in for the coffee, although your product obviously stands alone. They're coming in for the ambiance, a knowledgeable owner, a nice, um, a nice cafe. Um, so the price isn't the most important thing. You know? No, no, it, it isn't, and it it never was. Right, it never was for my kind of business. Yeah, people want community. People want to come and say, "Hi, Frank. How are you doing today?" Absolutely. And, and just to, uh, when I when my customers come in, I say, how's life? I ask uh, anything new and exciting. What are you doing this weekend? Because uh, it's not about, you know, the transaction at all. It's, it's how we can grow each other's lives, have these conversations. I learn so much. Um, I tell one uh, awesome customer that I, I'm going to do a vegetable garden now. And so he brought me some lettuce oh, one wow. day. And, uh, um, or uh, someone's doing a garden and do you need some of the burlap bags uh, for your garden? I said, oh, that's awesome. Uh, nice. Bring it out to your car. So uh, you never know who you're talking to. Yeah. I, um, I, I grew up uh, as an only child and uh, hanging out with adults in my younger life and uh, just knew to talk to everybody. There's no one. I, I feel like a really old person every time <laughs> I go somewhere because I, I never just do a transaction and just leave. I'm talking to the person behind me, the person over there, um, cracking jokes uh, because you never know. It's a, someone could could be a change in your life that you didn't you didn't see. Yeah. Now talking about that chatty atmosphere, when I uh, came in your new location, I joked with you that being from New York, I thought it'd be like a Central Perk in Friends, and there'd be couches and everything. Yeah, yeah. And you said I will never have a couch in my coffee shop. No, I love <laughs> couches, but uh, not in my coffee shop. Why is that? Because I want it to be a professional place oh. where uh, people can have. Um, if if you if you're in a, on a couch, you're going to be spending a long time there. And I I'm, I'm not one of those coffee shop owners that want you to just get your cappuccino and leave. Not that way. You can sit there all day long. Uh, but if you are sitting with another professional and you're having a meeting, you want to have a professional looking area. That's fair. Um, and so I always wanted it to be a networking joint. The Ferndale place before the pandemic was crazy networking. I knew everyone, what they did for a living. And then I would say, hey, um, meet this plumber. You just bought a house. Here's an awesome plumber that um, if you ever have problems, hope you never have problems. But um, And so I made so much closed business for people, uh, thousands of dollars uh, 
literally every week for different business owners by just coming into my shop. Yeah. Uh, wow. And so that's a huge part, and that's why I want the more professional-looking chairs. Um, and the couches, you just – you just <laughs> uh, you'll sit back there and just enjoy it, especially my coffee. A lot, of, a lot of spilled coffee on the couches is probably ah, – I don't really care about that. Too much relaxing. <laughs> yeah. Yes, it, it is too much relaxing. And I also want people to have a place to go where they don't have to sit forever. I have no food. Right. So when you're sitting with someone on a date – or a business meeting, and you're pretty much done with the other person. Um, if you have a bowl of food there, it's kind of awkward yeah. to get it up, you know, for home kind of thing. Uh, so I like, I just have coffee, tea, hot cocoa. Do you have many dates at your coffee shop? Oh, lots, lots. And there any are a lot of people. Any yet? Yes. Oh, yeah. There we go. Several, uh, wow. several uh, people proposed in the Ferndale shop, N- not in the Berkeley yet. Oh, okay. um, Did they invite you to the wedding? Only one, <laughs> only one. I, it's okay. It's all right. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but no one's invited me. But a lot of of the couples that got engaged met each other uh, by coffee favors. Aww. They'll buy small two ounce sample bags for their guests nice. or for their wedding uh, crew. Yeah. So thinking of that, I know we we're talking about your shop a lot, and obviously that sounds great. We run a coffee shop. There's people, customers, but you're charging. Two to five dollars a cup of coffee. Is, how's that going to work? I imagine the nuts and bolts of you paying yourself is wholesale business, restaurant business, things like uh, wedding favors, all that auxiliary business. How do you grow that? I grew up uh, the wholesale and the beans. Uh, that was really the whole business. I always thought no one's going to come into my shop in Ferndale. It was off the beaten path. It was going to be wholesale. Okay. And so. All of that, the way for a a business really to get awesome wholesale accounts is by getting a warm reduction. So right now it's a huge word of mouth because people come in, they own restaurants, they own cafes, and uh, they come in and they've been buying my coffee for their home. And maybe they don't realize that it would be awesome in their office. Too. So uh, I give them a tour of the cafe. We talk about it. They see a list of all the wholesale accounts wow. in my cafe, all the top ones, and it gives them ideas. So it's all word of mouth now. And the supermarkets, um, Woodward Corner Market, Western, and uh, Whole Foods, you see my coffee on the shelf every week, maybe a good wholesale account. Yeah. That's honestly so amazing because it's like really it's the power of community, like leveling your community to say, hey, like, I want to meet this person. And, like, it's even in our businesses. It's like, hey, you have – like, all my business is really referral for social media. And it's like you meet those people, you meet them, but maybe three months later they come back to you and they're like, oh, hey, we want to work with you now. So I bet same thing for you. Yes. And it's also helping other people without um, – re- requiring or expecting anything in exchange. Yeah. And you never know how that goodness will re- reward you in the in the future. Yeah. You never know what new job um, that person who came into the cafe and didn't have their credit card on them so take the coffee, come back whenever you come back, and then they become the manager of a certain restaurant and they remember that yeah. and so um, yeah, just doing something for someone else with integrity and for the reason just you're doing it, not yes. because, hey, you're going to owe me something one day. No one wants that. And the, you the know, pe- Just don't do it then. Yeah. You know? Pays to be nice. Yeah. Yes. But it, it's a beautiful thing. What I tell people all the time is that when you have power, uh, good power, like I do as a coffee shop owner that I know so many people, you want a plumber, you want a financial consultant, you, whatever you want, I, I got a guy. Yeah. And, or a gal. Yeah. Um, but, but I got a guy. And so that power that I have, I should use it. Exactly. Um, and so whether it, it helps me or not, that's um, – if you do something really, really well um, and you have this pulpit in this uh, cafe where all these different people, thousands of people come every month here, connect them. Yeah. It's a, just a no-brainer. I love the way you, that you think about that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, definitely built. I mean, what what is more community than the local coffee shop? Not much more, very right? Yes. True. And uh, so. the, the coffee shops that opened up for the first time 
um, in the Middle Ages were all speakeasies. They're all people hanging out and talking. Yeah. It was just uh, you go there for a conversation. That's where you'd go meet. And I wanted that always to be my cafe. Talking of speakeasy, I do want to ask your view on alcoholic coffee drinks. I'm sure you got some strong ones. Oh, I love them. <laughs> yeah. I love them. Um, I'm, the great thing is that I could drink 20 plus cups of coffee. But if you're in a restaurant and you see them make an espresso martini and pour some bad espresso in, does it break your heart a little it bit? It does. It does <laughs> because it tastes, you know, I, I've done this at home with different restaurants. They've used my coffee um, for these. It changes everything. It, uh, like any chef will tell you it's the ingredients it's uh, and how you put it together. Yeah. But uh, eggs change um, from season to season. If you buy farm fresh eggs, all these ingredients are completely different. My coffee changes one bag of coffee next to another 132 pound bag of green and roasted coffee beans. Those, those could be very different. Yeah. It could have been a different altitude and and, um, and things like that. So um, I l- love them. I I was making um, kind of Kahlua um, a coffee uh, coffee with vodka. Um, for my home for, uh, for a while. Amazing. Um, nice. And uh, it's it's so easy. Yes. I mean, you should use fresh roasted coffee. Right. So, And I have cold brew, bottles of cold brew that are perfect for that kind of thing. For an espresso martini, uh, already concentrated coffee. That's awesome. It's, it's cold. Yeah. Um, so... So being in the coffee business for a while, what do you think of like all like the the new trends? Like you have to have cold brew for for an example. Like that just came out really in the last few years. A uh, cold brew I really like, um, but uh, it there are always trends and fats. Yes. And the thing is that uh, I've always been what and when you have a business, what's the basic thing that you do? And the basic thing that I do is I roast coffee fresh to order. That's it. So all the other trends. So I have coffee ice cream. Ooh. I make my own coffee ice cream. I have coffee soda, Brooklyn-born coffee soda uh, that I call it. I have Anything. I have fruit of the bean, cascada soda. This cascada Ooh. is the fruit of the coffee bean that's dried as a tea, brewed as a tea, and then carbonated uh, by us. And so we have that on tap. So all these crazy things. It really is – it, is it going to enhance people's lives? That's always with new products okay. like that. Um, I, don't, I don't do nitro coffee. I'm not a big soda guy, but I tried a bit of your coffee soda when I was in there. It was great. Thank you very much. And, um, and no preservatives, no sugar. No, there you go. No sugar. Passion. It's, it, it's not going to compete against Pepsi or Coca-Cola. <laughs> but You're not doing a Super Bowl ad? Yeah, no? that would that'd okay. be awesome. That would be awesome. <laughs> Talking of um, businesses and things that may hit your bottom line, how did you um, go through some tough times? I know you talked maybe one mistake you made was uh, staffing. Um, but we've talked a lot about how your coffee shop is running really well now. But what was the a few moments where you had to dig deep and call on your reserves of self-belief to, to make it through? Uh, there were several turning points. Several turning points. Uh, in the beginning, I just uh, my wife and I – Emptied all of our, um, we had big pockets at the time, and uh, and all the uh, figuratively dropped all the money on the table and uh, built this business. Um, my prices weren't high enough. My we were winning best coffee shop, best tea shop year after year online, and all of that. And one day during some Jewish holiday, we we're just having a conversation, my wife and I, and um, realized you know. We're not making money. We're losing money. Mm. We're not paying ourselves. Sorry. And um, it's an awesome business. Everyone loves us. It's the best coffee around. We have 150 wholesale accounts three years uh, in uh, starting this business. That's fantastic. We should be making money. Um, there were a couple of things. One is that our wholesale accounts were taking advantage of us, not all of them, um, and not paying us on time. So they were doing net 90 or net 120, uh, and and so we were becoming their bank. That was one thing. I had to stop that. So I had to say COD. Um, and I learned that restaurants had, when they bought liquor, they had to pay it right then and there. So $3,000 bill for liquor, here's the check. Um, so that taught me a lot. 
why can't they pay $200 to Hazano Coffee Roasters? Mm-hmm. So learn that. I raised my prices about 10% at that time. That was a huge part. Um, and those two things um, helped the business explode right. because I had cash flow um, and, and I had uh, security, better security. Um, staffing had always been a problem because I didn't want to fire people, let people go who were doing a fantastic job for me. Um, so that was always the pandemic. It's for a different conversation, but the pandemic helped cure me of, um, of my staffing woes in many ways. Um, the other thing is that we finally, after several years, five or six years in business, we had finally become bankable. Oh, so wow. it wasn't my own. Um, if you have to pay for covers, payroll and coffee beans that have to be paid net 30, all of that, you start taking uh, credit cards and a lot of credit card debt and a lot of a lot of small businesses do that because this is your passion. Yes. You got to support it. No bank wants to look at a coffee roaster, uh, especially a family-owned one. Mm-hmm. That's like the worst, uh, <laughs> the, the worst business to invest in because it's just a scary business, uh, and the the owner hasn't really uh, found their sea legs at all. And so I went to the ten thousand small businesses. Um, for about 10 months of free classes, um, this is great program, Goldman Sachs, 10,000 Small Businesses, and it, it helped classes with professors from different universities um, talking about everything, finance, culture, um, accounting, everything about businesses. And, um, and this was uh, like once every week or so classes okay. with 30 other scholars, they call them, right. um, fellow uh, business owners. And that helped me um, learn about how to uh, talk about my business. And the biggest thing about that is that one of the professors talked about when you look at an opportunity, uh, when you're doing SWOT analysis with strengths, weaknesses, um, opportunities, and threats, that opportunities, when you think about that, you're going to do your business plan, everything, but does it fit your life? Does it fit your life? And that's a huge part that you forget about when you're a business owner, um, when you have different opportunities. Does it, can you do everything else in your life? Can you go on dates regularly with, with your uh, can you teach you with your wife? Can you teach your kids how to drive? Do you have that time with that opportunity, no matter how much money it makes you? Mm-hmm. Because you're not going to be happy if that opportunity takes over your life. Yeah. So but that's that your bankability. biggest advice to someone looking to turn their hobby into a passion, not necessarily a restaurant, coffee shop, but let's say someone who is good at tattoos and wants to open their tattoo store. Is it look at the opportunities? Does it fit your life? Or what would be some other... Um, advice you would give to someone wanting to turn a hobby into a profession? Um, I would first write a business plan. Write a business plan and um, and find out do you have uh, – what are the hours? I mean, it's really about fitting your life. What are the hours and um, where do you want to be? And are you better than any, everyone else in the area? Um, What's your be- point of difference, I guess? Yeah. Yes. Uh, it's really a – there's this book called The Blue Ocean Strategy. And it's not a very good book. It's, uh, it's one of those business books that are uh, kind of painful to read. But every business owner should read it because the main idea of it is that you should make your business – anything you do in your life, um, whatever it is, golfing or um, tai chi, karate, you should uh, do it as if you're on an island – and there are – there's no one – just blue ocean all around you and there are no sharks. The sharks are the competition. Um, that you're doing something so special that no one can compete with you. Are you doing something different? I would never have foofy drinks. I wouldn't have flavorings or sugary drinks because that's not what – that's not my passion. That doesn't fit me. Um, and there's so many other businesses. There's – I – there are – a hundred businesses around that do that. So why right. would I go into that? That's the uh, the big thing. I mean, if it's something that's going to bring you joy every day, then do it. Right. 
perfect. And one of the final questions for me is, you talked about writing a business plan. Are you where your business plan said you would be? And then what is the plan for the next five, 10 years? Um, so what the plan is for the next five or 10 years is, uh, is less clear as it was five or 10 years ago. Okay. Because, uh, uh, and, and I only say that because there's nothing dramatic that I, that I foresee or need to have. Um, I bought a building. We have a healthy business, and it fits my life. And I have all this time to uh, do things after work. Amazing. Um, and I don't go to sleep at night worrying about the business, which is a huge thing that happens uh, some day, one day for hopefully all business owners. Um, there are different opportunities that I have that I'm asking myself right now, it, it doesn't fit my life, but I would like to um, sell pints of my coffee ice cream, which is really wow. awesome. Wow, okay. Um, in like, supermarkets. Can we get free samples? You yeah, definitely. We need some. Yeah, yes. yeah come by. But, and uh, that Kahlua you mentioned said, um, as well. Cause... I didn't think it would be so good uh, <laughs> if I brought it uh, this morning. <laughs> um, but I also have this coffee soda. I have a 50-page um, a um, um, business plan for the coffee soda. Wow. And it's a very strong business plan, and it would work, but it would take a lot of my time and more capital, things like that. Is it worth it? Is it worth it? It would sell well. Uh, but I see you uh, going on Shark Tank in the future, getting funding for coffee, soda, and ice cream. No, the problem is, is my personality. Yeah. My personality. You would listen uh, to Mark Cuban, you'd say. No. Um, I don't want to listen to anyone. <laughs> okay. I don't. Um, I, I you know, that, I listen yeah. to my wife, and that's really it. Um, because I, I just, and that's part of uh, my job as a cantor. I love being a cantor uh, in synagogues, but you often have. 300 to 1,000 bosses, and that's not me. I'm, I'm right. a New Yorker. and um, But you have to take advice at some point. I'm not saying it will change what you're thinking, but there must be something, something people say to you that, okay, I'll take that bit of what you're saying, but I won't take that bit. Absolutely, but it takes time. Okay. It takes time. I really digest it and look at all the different angles um, when they give me advice. Uh, people give me advice all the time. On, uh, on ask for advice. Um, and sometimes I say, like a month later, that was awesome advice. That was great. Um, but most of the time, I, I like uh, living a life where I can listen to people's advice and don't have to do anything about it. Yeah. Uh, but if I went on Shark Tank, I, I always wanted to. I think we'd do well on Shark I Tank. Think you would and it would too. be so much fun uh, to, uh, to be on Shark Tank. But um, then I'd have to listen to one of those uh, guys. Yeah. And you went into so, business for yourself to work for yourself. So. Yes. And the problem is with growing the business. So uh, people have always asked, and I, we would do very well if I opened up three or four Hazanos mm -hmm. around the state. Uh, and there are other places all around the country if I had a couple million dollars uh, um, that I, I didn't know what to do with. Uh, I'd love to. New York, um, there are heavy Jewish areas in New York that it would just do very well. Um, what about the truck? I know you don't want to open up other locations, but what about a yeah. truck to go to sporting I've events? I've thought or? about that a lot. Thought yeah. about that a lot, um, especially during the pandemic. Um, but again, that doesn't fit me. No. So I I did all the thinking about it. Uh, do I want to be on a, a truck, a hot truck, you know, if it's air-conditioned, but um, <laughs> and just hang out there for six hours kind of thing? Um, and I'd want to be there because the unfortunate – and just the unfortunate thing about my business is that it needs me. That 100%. I'm the I'm the I'm the face behind the business, and I've tried to kill myself off. My third book that I'm writing is um, how to kill yourself off from your business, so your business won't kill you. <laughs> um, so, and the the whole idea is about pushing yourself out from doing all the small things in the business, and um, but I couldn't fully kill myself off. It's so hard. Even a small business owner, like, it's like, you're like, oh, I have all these hours. Oh, I can maybe go on vacation for a month. And I'm like, no, like, my business is really, like, it's me. And I, I have to be there. Even if my staff doesn't necessarily need me, I just, like, I cannot give up that control, personally. Yes. It's not even, not even about control, because I think you could give. Yeah. You know, but your staff does need you. 100%. They, do, they just need, um, even just to say, yeah, that's good work, or do it this way. And my staff is phenomenal. My staff is fantastic, um, and I, I, but I'm 
being there, I'm constantly not nitpicking. Nitpicking is okay, but nitpicking on small things. So when people come into my shop, I want when once they open that door and the alarm goes off, it says front door. I want people to turn around no matter what they're doing and say, hi, how are you? We'll be right with you immediately with a big smile. I love that. I don't want five, I don't want a millisecond to pass by where they haven't been welcomed because we don't know what happened in their lives today. Uh, they just got a divorce. They just found out a good friend is sick and that that smile could change their whole day. Yeah. And that's so, why you're still in business compared to most other coffee shops who like go under. It's like you really share the passion and you really sh- you really share like you love coffee, you love doing this and that's really why you're still in business. It's, people also want to meet you and they want to see you. They want to say, "Hi, Frank, like I've had a bad day, please help me." And it's cool for <laughs> people. Yeah, and give it's, me coffee. It's, it's cool for me when I go around the country. My wife and I love road trips, going to a different coffee roastery. Mm. They don't know me at all. I said, come on back. Let me show you. Yeah. Uh, back. And the, it's the owner. The owner's talking mm. to me. And it's the same thing in my coffee shop. I'm available. You know, Come on back. You've, you've never been here before? Come on back. Let me show you the whole coffee roasting enterprise, um, what it is what we do no yeah it's very interesting i recommend if you're in berkeley 12 mile definitely stop in and and say hi to frank and he'll show you his roaster and uh you can try one of his uh coffees and maybe even the one that tastes like a chocolate covered granny smith no i mean yeah your your love for life shows through is like there is it keating quote like um suck the marrow out of life that was in that dead poet society movie yes Um, yeah the zeal for life and you express it through coffee is, uh, is great to see, and we've loved having you on, Frank. Thank, Thank you, you very for much. being here. Thanks we, for having me. We learned so much, and I can definitely not wait to come and have a tour. That'd be great. Yeah. Anytime. Keith. Jordana, let's get to the heart of the matter. Let's Frank, do it. What a great guy. Amazing. He was so awesome, and I'm really excited to try the coffee ice cream. Yeah, it's great coffee and great coffee soda, and uh, I haven't tried the coffee ice cream. I've just had, like, the regular brands out there, so I'm excited to try his. Yes. On my way home, I'm going to stop by. I live right near there, so. There you go. It'd be great. Yes. But I thought that he was an amazing guest, and I really loved his point about, like, he could expand, he could grow more, but does it fit your life? I feel like all business owners, we have the same thing. We're like, what way do we expand? Do we still, but we still need to have work-life balance, and that's always been a struggle for me, so I feel like. I really want to think to myself, like, does this fit my life, my expansion plan, or should I keep it a certain way? Yeah, no, I think that's key. And one thing I thought as we invite different guests onto this podcast is is what is success? Success isn't necessarily the biggest and the best and being a multimillionaire. I mean, that could be one form of success, but true success as well can be successful business, great work-life balance, which ultimately is what a lot of us strive for. Yeah, I mean, I think that's really keen. Like, I love that he was so passionate. Like, you could feel the passion him sitting here by saying, like, he was a canter and then he went to do coffee roasting. But you could tell, like, he was doing coffee roasting so long and he loves it so much. And that really was his passion. But, like, he didn't know how to kind of get out of being a canter and, like, kind of figuring out, like, oh, where's the, where am I going to make the money? Yeah, when someone has that passion and and transfers it, it makes you more interested. Like, you may not understand all the great painters and paintings but if you're at an art gallery and the, the 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 curators there and really telling you about the artists and what they were thinking when they painted it it makes you see that painting in a whole different light so when he's describing the, the beans and all the different flavor profiles um it really makes you appreciate it and and i have had a coffee in there and, and you do taste you know uh, a lot more vibrant flavors in this coffee than you do other places well i honestly like i never realized how much went into coffee so i feel like i got enlightened today it was very educational which i love that's right and i'm still i want to try that chocolate covered granny smith uh, that flavor yeah and the last point i really want to make is that I really love that he said, like, anybody walks in his coffee shop, it's very referral-based. So it's like people can tell other people to come into your coffee shop if somebody has a bad day. Oh, you need this person? I'd be happy to help. And with your business, I can say, in my business at least, like, all my business is very referral-based. Like, I can meet somebody today, and they won't want to work with me for three months. And I've always learned since I was a kid, like, it's always important to be nice. Even if you can't help that person right then and there, you can always refer them out, or they can always refer you. I've had people who I've met seven months ago, and then yesterday they referred me a client. So you just really never know. Yeah, you never know. You never know who you're going to meet, and you do have to put out 
a consistent brand of just caring about people and products and uh, wanting to work with other... Uh, I have to do that again. Okay. Oh, sorry. I don't know what I was trying to say. We'll cut that. Just, yeah. I'll come to cut 311. Well, you said about wanting to be nice, right? Yeah. Okay. Like you want, like you want to be nice to everybody. Yeah, definitely. You want to portray a consistent image. Um, in my business, uh, a lot of my customers they they know my name, but also my accent helps a little bit. And they're <laughs> like, oh, my, I use the English credit card guy, and uh, I've had a lot of customers with me for many years because they can call me, and uh, you know I'm always there for them. And it sounds the same with Frank. You know, the, and, and all the successful business owners we speak to is you got to develop a culture of caring about your customers first. Yes, and I think that is so key. So, yeah, so who are some people we have coming up? People can look forward to the next few weeks. We have. Well, we're, I'm very excited about some people who are coming up. We've got uh, the mayor of Troy oh, yes. coming up. Oh, yes, I'm excited. And, uh, Mr. Mayor. And then uh, some uh, some people in the sports industry. People and in video. People in video. Uh, a, a leadership and culture professional who works with some of the biggest companies around on their leadership. And uh, many more as well before the end of the year. Yeah, we're, I'm so excited. And. Thank you for the podcast. It's been a great listen. Yeah, thank you. It's been thank great you. Chatting. Yeah, thank you, all our listeners. And uh, please feel free to email us with any questions at hosts at self belief podcast. Jordana's really getting all our social channels going. So any feedback on there is, is more than welcome. Yes, please rate us and follow us. Also, the more ratings we can get, the higher we get ranked on the podcast list. So we'd love for you to follow and rate us. Yeah, and we do want to mention our sponsors, Office Evolution of Troy. It's a great professional working space, I-75 and Big Beaver. Um, JAC Digital does a fantastic job with companies, uh, social media, and obviously uh, regal payments. We look to help businesses accept payments in the most cost-effective and efficient ways possible from their customers. And we can't wait to see you next time. Thanks, everyone. Bye.